Hi there, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. My name is Lita. I'm the event manager. Many of you probably might have been more familiar with this gentleman before I was. He was just shopping in the bookstore a couple of months ago and thought, he has a book coming out. He should talk to the person who does the events. Mm -hmm. So he came in and he was really, really convincing. Bookstore events come through the home office in New York. But when I took a look at your killer emotions and I met Ken, I thought, you know what? This is an event that we have to do. And obviously people think that it's a book that they have to read also because it's reached number one on Amazon in a number of categories, number eight on Barnes & Noble, and I tried to get a bunch more books in for this evening because I thought with all the many, many television shows, radio interviews, et cetera, that Ken's been doing, that I should have tons and tons and tons of signed books available, except for the fact that, um, let's give a big round of applause because this book has gone into a second printing and you can't even get it right now. It is back ordered at every Ingram, Baker and & Taylor, and Barnes & Noble website. So it is flying off the shelves, and tonight we're here to celebrate its release with Ken Lindner. Let's give him a huge welcome, please. Thank you so much for your graciousness and for your great support. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Good evening, everybody. I'm very comfortable in front of you because your family your longtime friends, your some short-time friends, and I'm thrilled to see everybody. Um, just wanted to mention that I cannot be happier about your killer emotions because I wrote the book five years ago, and so many people told me it would not work. And it was rejected by a number of agents. It was not well received by some publishing houses. Now, the good news was, was that I took the constructive criticism and I reworked the manuscript. But I was positive that the emotional component of decision making really had not been explored. And no matter what anybody said, I stuck with it. I self-published it because I wanted to make it work. And I wasn't going to let anybody tell me that this was not going to be a success. So uh, if anything, it is a testament to persistence, to believing in your ideas, and, uh, and just figuring out the choreography, the set of steps to get things accomplished. So it makes me feel good that it's being well received, and most importantly, that you all are here, and that I can celebrate with you all. So thank you so much. Over the past 30 years, I've counseled thousands and thousands of people to make positive life choices. And the one thing that I've seen that's been a constant is the fact that if you are sad, if you are angry, if you feel disrespected, if you're hurt, if you feel resentful, you oftentimes opt for a quick, emotion assuaging fix just to feel good for the time being. But oftentimes that short-term decision is inconsistent with what you want in the long term of your life. So you wind up making a self-sabotaging decision. And your killer emotions basically helps one master their emotions, helps one change the behaviors that need changing, and enables you to break up your toxic scripting. And I'll explain all of this as we go along. Um, the way I came to write the book was, I had written a book about seven years ago called Crunch Time. And crunch time was all about the intellectual component of decision making, life strategies. And for what it was, it was pretty good. But I was giving a speech about, I don't know, five years ago at a television convention. And like a comedian tries out new jokes, I decided to try out 
a new concept. And the concept was, was that I didn't talk about crunch time so much. What I said was, was that you can have the best life strategies. You can be the smartest person in the room, but if you let your emotions overwhelm you, you're gonna to go to hell in a handbasket. And I talked about the emotional component of decision making and the seven steps of emotion mastery that I had worked on for the past 25 years with my clients. And at the end of the speech, Oprah's producers, ex-producers actually, came up to me and said, you've come up with something unique because nobody deals with the emotional component of decision making. They only focus on the cognitive intellectual. If you could put this in a book, you will make a big difference in people's lives. So I took that and I went back and wrote the book. And as I said, it's had many incarnations, but uh, it's, it's obviously come to be a great reality. Um, I would like to explain a little bit more and then go into a story that I hope will elucidate what makes your killer emotions um, different. And the thing that works for your killer emotions is that what the book talks about is using your emotions, using the energy charges of your emotions to compel you to fuel you, to motivate you, to make positive life choices. And the formula that I'm going to talk about, in essence, overpowers the energy charges of the, um, of the toxic emotions or potentially toxic emotions that can sabotage you. So here's how I discovered the formula. I was about nine or 10 years old and I thought my dad didn't love me because my dad worked six days a week and many nights and basically was never there. He um, had to support our family and what I didn't know was that my dad and mom had made an agreement that my mom was gonna be a stay-at-home mom and that my dad was gonna support the family and, and get me the best education that he never had. But as a seven, six, five-year-old child, I didn't understand that. So every time my dad wasn't there, every time I felt my dad wasn't there for me, I would basically reflexively binge eat. And I'd eat anything and everything that was accessible to me. Macaroni and cheese and cake and everything that was fattening. It made me feel good for the moment but I felt terrible about myself. And in fact, I have very vivid memories of going into a candy store when I was, oh, I don't know, six years old or seven years old and asking the candy store man, or it wasn't a candy store, it was more like a, a diner. And I asked the person that owned the diner, can I buy this candy? And he looked at me in front of all the customers who were eating and said, do you really need that? And I walked out of there, seven shades of red, so embarrassed, tears streaming down. And I also remember kids, literally when I was on the beach, this guy would count the rolls of fat around my stomach and he used to call me tire boy. So there was a lot of embarrassment, there was a lot of shame, and it all stemmed from the fact that I felt unloved um, I didn't have my dad's approval.